Welcome to First Chapter Friday. Today is International Day of Persons with Disabilities, which aims to promote an understanding of disability issues and mobilize support for the dignity, rights, and well-being of persons with disabilities. Today's book is Sick Kids in Love by Hannah Moskowitz. Chapter 1. Hospitals should be a setting on white noise machines. The nurses laughing at the station and the sound of their squeaky sneakers on the floor. The rush of tubes sending blood back and forth from the lab. The rhythmic beeping of someone rolling over onto an IV. Every once in a while, that flurry of activity, like an awkward dance break. It always sounds the same here. I get infusions at Linefield and West once a month, after school, on the first Monday. I could do injections at home instead, but those are twice a month instead of once, so I'll trade the inconvenience for half the needle sticks. Plus, I'm here all the time anyway. It's not that much trouble to go down to the drip room. That's what we call the ambulatory medical unit. Because, come on, sit in one of those comfy chairs, eat goldfish crackers, and study for two hours. It's always kind of awkward because the other people there are usually cancer patients. And I know they probably assume I'm a cancer patient too. And it feels like lying to them to let them assume that. Some of them are dying. I'm not dying. I'm just sick. And have been for 11 years now. And I don't look like I'm dying. People come down from their rooms to get chemo wearing their hospital gowns and scrub caps over their heads. And I'm looking like I just walked out of high school. Because I did. I think they hate me, the cancer people. This is only my second month doing infusions. I was fine on pills for a long time, but lately my fingers have been swelling and making it hard to type, and my ankles have been keeping me out of gym class, which is sort of fine by me, but also sort of not in that complicated way, like when you win an argument, but by doing something really shady and gross. My doctor wanted to try something else, so here I am with a new treatment plan and a new set of people to look at me and think that I don't look sick enough. I should stop wearing makeup on infusion days. Blush makes anyone look healthy. So I look away when people come in and I study, and sometimes I drift off a little because of the hospital noises. Today there's nobody else in the infusion room, just me and the fluorescent lights and a bird on the tree outside the window. And I close my eyes for what feels like a second, but there must have been longer because now there's someone here in the chair, two over from mine. The first thing I notice is he's the first person I've ever seen in here who looks about my age. The second thing I notice is the way his hair curls behind his ears. He's watching something on his phone, but I'm thinking, you're pretty, you're pretty, you're pretty, hard enough that I think he hears it, which is honestly probably possible considering exactly how hard I'm thinking it. And then he looks up at me. Sorry, I say. He keeps looking at me. Not a lot of young people here, I explain. There's that six-year-old with leukemia, he says. He's always bringing those trucks that are the same size as his arms, and he just smashes them together. I think it's supposed to be violent, but there's something kind of romantic about it, like the trucks just can't stay away from each other. What? I say. Oh, you don't know that kid? I'm only here once a month. He cranes his neck to look at my IV bag, like it's going to be some special color. They all look the same. What are you in for? He says. A lot of people here have central lines, but I just have an IV going into my hand, since it's not like they need access to my veins. He has the same setup. Infusions, I say. I don't know what that is. Rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, no way, he says, in the same voice you'd use if someone told you their uncle has the same birthday as you. Mm Mm-hmm, since I was nine. He holds up the notebook in my lap. What are you lurking on? What's on your phone? He grins. I asked you first. I hope he doesn't have cancer. His eyelashes are so long. He can't lose those eyelashes. Oh, gosh. I think that's the worst thing I've ever thought. I hold my notebook up to my chest and stare him down. He's pale in both a white way and a sick way, but his eyes are green, bright sparkly green. He smiles and he tilts his phone toward me. Oh God, he has dimples. Just kill me right now in the strip room. It's this woman who makes robots and then she posts videos of them not working correctly. Like this one's supposed to be tying her shoe and instead it rips the shoe open. This is what I want to do with my life. Build robots that don't work, I ask. Yeah, he says. I show him my notebook. I have an advice column in my school newspaper, or I edit the advice column. Every week, I come up with a few questions, and then I gather people's answers and pick the good ones and write up a summary about it. I think of a way, I think of it a way to bring everything they say together and make some kind of point about it. Oh, neat. That's why, that's what I want to do with my life now. Forget robots. You can't, I say, I'm doing that. You're doing this forever, he asks. You're going to want to retire at some point. So you want to take over from me when I'm old? I don't know what you have. Like, what do you have? How long are you living? Well, now, that's the worst thing I've ever said. To go along with the worst thing I've ever thought. It sounded cute and edgy in my head, 
But now it's out there, and I can't believe I said it in this room where the cancer, pe cancer people come. They might not be here right now, but if you could hear my thoughts earlier, they probably can too, wherever they are. Cancer people just know. Plus, you know, he could actually be dying. That was beautifully distasteful, he says. I can't believe I just said that. No, it's good. Now we've established we have the same sense of humor. I don't know if I do have the same sense of humor or if I was just trying to be the cool girl because of his eyelashes, but I'm willing to try. And, he says, lucky for both of us, I have some hipster disease you've never heard of and it's not fatal, so nice try. Though I wish it were just for how awkward you'd feel right now in this moment. I'd know if you were dying, I said. Oh yeah? How? You wouldn't be wasting your time talking to me. You talk to me first. Maybe I'm just being polite, he says. And I bet I have heard of it, I say. My dad's a doctor, so I now know a lot. Gaucher's disease, he says, or something like that. Yeah, I don't even know how to spell that one. What is it? I ask. Google it. You have a phone. I can't. I don't know how to spell it. He grins. Your dad's a doctor? Yeah, sick girl with a doctor dad. Pretty lucky. He does this low whistle, then points through the window of the drip room at a guy signing paperwork at the counter. That's your dad, I ask? It is, he says. He looks young, maybe late 30s, and like he does a lot of hiking. Probably not with the sick boy next to me. He comes with me every week, he says. I'm 16 in three months, and I've been doing this my whole life, and he comes with me every time. That's sweet, I say. Yeah, it is. You're younger than me. That's why it's up to me to take over your advice column. He coughs a little. How old are you, 35? 35, I say. Seriously? Do you have a career? Are you retired? I'm 16. So I was close. What's your name? Isabel, I say. That was my grandmother's name, he says. I laugh accidentally. He puts his hand on his chest like he's offended. Hey, she was a lovely woman, he says. She wasn't allergic to poison ivy. He used to pull it right out of the ground with her bare hands. I tried to copy it once. Didn't go so well, I say. Did not. Is that how you got your disease, I ask? It's genetic, doctor, he says. He pushes his hair back from his eyes and smiles at me. Sasha. What? That's my name. Sasha. No way, I say. He tilts his head back and grins. No way. That's quite a name, I said. Eh, he says. It's no Isabel. So what's your answer? What? To your answer. To your question. What's your favorite place in New York? Oh, I say. I don't answer the questions. I just ask them. Hmm, he says. It's actually for the best. I shift around in the chair some. Sometimes I can sneak in, like, questions about me and my life and have people answer them. That's smart, he says. That's some clever shit right there. Sometimes I get way too specific, though, and then I can't use them in the paper, I say. But I still get the advice and an excuse to talk to people. I like to talk to people. Sure, how else are you going to ask them when they're, grant when they're going to die? Please, I say, we're going to pretend that I didn't have that didn't happen and I didn't ask that. We have to. So ask me your question, then, he says. Change the subject. Okay, I say. What's your favorite place in New York? My favorite place? I think it's right here. The drip room? He laughs. Not the drip room specifically, just here, this hospital. You like the hospital? I know, he says. It's weird. No, I, I've never not met another person who likes the hospital. I don't always like them, he says. But hey, you're not always going to like anywhere, right? At least here, you would get to just relax and be sick and not have to be anything else. You should see me when I'm admitted. Just a total sick caricature, demanding jello. Plus, they know me here. I live in Chelsea, and I still trek out to Queens every 10 days to visit this place. I grew up here, I say. My dad's a cheap physician. No way, he says. No way. Well, he says, I like your house. I need a job title for you, I say, showing him my notebook. See, it'll say Sasha, um... Right, and then you're 16, and then your job, and you can pick something funny if you want. I let people put down whatever they want. Brother, he says. Put brother. He looks at my IV. Looks like your bag's done. Oh, yeah. See you next time, he says. I'm only here once a month, I say. Yeah, but you live here, right? He closes his eyes, smiling. I'm just kidding, he says. I can be patient. Probably. Well, I can try. I like trying new things. Kathy, one of the nurses, comes up and tapes up my IV. Bye, Sasha, I say. His eyes are still closed. See you later, Grandma. I take my phone out of my pocket on the way to feel the elevator or the way to the elevator and open up a text for Mara, but my fingers feel cold and stiff like frozen tree branches. I stretch them toward my palm and back up to my wrist. I text I text Mara. 
met a cute boy. She immediately answers, which is why she's always the first person I text for play-by-plays. Mara says, no boys, you know your job. I roll my eyes and press the button for the cafeteria. I love Mara, but she has no idea the real reason why I don't date. Not that it matters. The point is that I don't. If that boy's waiting for me, he'll be waiting a long time. And that's the first chapter of Sick Kids in Love by Hannah Moskowitz. Check it out at the Foster Library.